Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to this special webinar presentation from the Yale Institute of Sacred Music, Unorthodox War, Religion and the Russian Invasion of Ukraine, hosted by the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. The Yale Institute of Sacred Music is an interdisciplinary graduate center at Yale University that educates leaders who foster, explore, and study engagement with the sacred through music, worship, and the arts in Christian communities, diverse religious traditions, and public life. My name is Dr. Mark Rosine. I'm lecturer here at the ISM in liturgical studies, and I am delighted and honored to be joined this afternoon by Reverend Dr. Nicholas E. Denisenko. Dr. Denisenko is the Emil and Alfreda Jokum Chair in Theology at Valparaiso University in Indiana. He's written several books and articles about Eastern Christian worship, thought, and culture. And among his most recent books is The Orthodox Church in Ukraine, A Century of Separation, published in 2019 with Northern Illinois University Press. Nick, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you with us. So uh, we'll, we'll go today until 3.30. Um, so we'll spend the first uh, 45 minutes or so in conversation, and then uh, we will open it up to a Q&A from our audience. So if at any point during our conversation, those in the audience want to drop a question, just type it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen there, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can. So all right, let's begin our conversation, Nick. Um, so glad you could join us uh, and sort of give us the opportunity to get some insight into what's going on in this war. I mean, we've all been watching with horror as um, things have unfolded in Ukraine over these past few weeks and uh, sort of getting worse and worse and more and more unthinkable. And at the center, it seems, of this conflict uh, is a kind of a, a, a haunting presence of religion, a haunting presence of religious faith. And yet it's a very a, a complex kind of presence. There's various groups uh, in Ukraine, various religious groups. Um, there's various groups in Russia that seem to share a sort of general religious similarity to the groups in Ukraine. So I thought it would be great if we could just start our conversation with you kind of giving us the lay of the land of who are these different religious groups in Ukraine and how are they reacting to this war? Yes, thank you very much, Mark. Um, so really, Ukraine is a multi-religious country um, that they, they have uh, all Ukrainian council of churches and religious organizations constituted by several representatives of different religions and churches. But the highest uh, percentage of people who have a religious affiliation in Ukraine belong to one of its Orthodox churches or the Greek Catholic Church. So I'll, I'll start by saying a few words about, about those churches. So there are uh, two dominant Orthodox churches in Ukraine um, one is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church uh, under the Moscow Patriarchate. Um, they have the most parishes, the most clergy, the most monastics. Uh, depending upon the sociological surveys that one consults, they're probably second when it comes to the number of adherents. Um, and that's a complicated issue, and I'll circle back to that in just a second. Um, the second Orthodox Church is the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. The Orthodox Church of Ukraine is a recent creation. From 1992 until 2019, there were three Orthodox churches in Ukraine. The one I just mentioned, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. And there was also a Kyiv Patriarchate and a Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church. In 2018, uh, those two churches, along with two bishops of the church under the Moscow Patriarchate United, this is on December 15th, 2018, mm -hmm. uh, at a unification council uh, that was orchestrated by the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople. And uh, that created the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. So essentially the Orthodox Church of Ukraine 
has, uh, it is an autocephalous church, which for our purposes means it is completely self-governing. Um, it is one of the 15 autocephalous churches. Uh, and it is also the newest autocephalous church. So in the Orthodox taxonomy, it ranks number 15 in the actual list of churches. It has approximately 7,000 parishes. It has, uh, you know, many monasteries and theological centers. Sociological surveys seem to indicate that the Orthodox Church of Ukraine has the highest number of adherents. And the reason that I wanted to circle back to that is there is a difference between uh, the statistics that one will find uh, separating official church reporting and sociological surveys. So uh, hovering right around 30% in sociological surveys. Uh, and usually the sort of go-to center is the Razumkov uh, Center. They are very active in uh, putting out surveys and publishing studies and data on religious affiliation, confessionality in Ukraine. About 28 to 31% in the last uh, five to six years, have uh, people have self-reported as being just Orthodox. Uh -huh. so it's kind of hard to, to know where they belong, meaning that they might not know what specific confession their church is. Um, that's not to say that the church doesn't have <laughs> a confession, but, you know, Orthodoxy is, is the dominant faith tradition in Ukraine. And I think it's important to mention also the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church, um, the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church is, uh, I don't know what percentage they are, but, but they're a, a very vocal uh, church. They are very involved. They have some of the most sophisticated theological education. They have a Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. Traditionally, they are located in Halachina. Uh, in West Ukraine and Lviv, um, but they are essentially uh, scattered across all of Ukraine at this point. Mm. And I also, I'll, you asked about the war, I thought I would take a second to, to just give a, the lay of the land on that as well. I think it depends on how we're defining it. I'm, I'm going to go with the assumption that the war that we're talking about was the uh, invasion of Ukraine that began on February 24th. And I'm saying this because if one asks Ukrainians, they'll say, well, this war has been going on since 2014. Yeah. And just today I was looking at some notes at some of the responses from 2014, which uh, were quite strong, quite vocal, uh, a lot of lament, protest, appeals for justice. A lot of the things that we're seeing today, we saw then. So uh, on the one hand, there are many issues that divide these three entities from one another, particularly the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under Moscow and the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I would describe their relationship as, as often hostile to one another, especially since 2019. Not always, and at the local level, relations can be good and cordial, but at, at the official level, it's been difficult. Uh, but what, what the churches have in common is that since the invasion, all of them have not only protested the war, but have implicated uh, President Putin of the Russian Federation for starting the war and called upon him to withdraw his troops. Now, certainly there are differences in the theological approaches, you know, the sort of nuances and details that we find in the appeals, but... Um, they have seemed to, to be on common ground right now in opposing the war and in implicating Putin as the aggressor in this war. And that has been an issue for many years now, the uh, complaints that some church leaders refuse to name the aggressor, to say his name. Yes. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So you mentioned that among these three bodies you have the Ukrainian, uh, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine, which is completely self-governing, completely independent. You have the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church, who ultimately has uh, their leadership is the, is the Pope of Rome in some, in some sort of distant sense. They have, of course, their own structures of leadership as well. And then you have the, the Orthodox Church 
the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate, which means that their kind of highest ranking bishop is actually the patriarch, the head bishop of Moscow. Um, so maybe it would be helpful if you could break down that relationship a little bit. I mean, you mentioned how all of these churches, uh, all of these three churches have been very vocal in naming President Putin as the oppressor. Uh, and yet maybe this is somewhat new. And I wonder if this is connected also to the church that is under Moscow. I mean, have they um, been a, a latecomer to this kind of uh, naming of the oppressor? And, and, and what is their relationship with Moscow right now? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, just a, a little bit of history, I think, might help to parse this out. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to very briefly touch upon the early 20th century, following the fall of the Romano dynasty, when you have uh, concurrent events occurring, where uh, you have the Kerensky provisional government in Russia, you have the convocation of the Moscow Council long planned for, which as, as you and I know, certainly, and, and perhaps others as well, uh, considered many church reforms uh, and perhaps most significantly restored the patriarchate, yeah. the office of patriarch. And this is in, this is in 1917, 1918. Yes, that's right. So yeah. um, the importance of the Ukrainian church is that there was a strong move for autocephaly, particularly in 1918. So this is a move for complete independence, uh, yes. complete self-governance, independent from governance by Moscow. Which would have made them, had they succeeded then, one of that number of churches that had canonical autocephaly. Right. Um, complete independence, really not subordinate to anyone at all, except, except to Christ. Right. Um, so... Uh, the only reason I want to mention this, it was uh, at that 1918 council that the all Ukrainian council adopted autonomy instead mm -hmm. of autocephaly. It was very controversial, but uh, that has essentially been the path of the church under Moscow since then is to be an autonomous church, which is limited self-governance, self, -governance, self uh, independence in all aspects of self-governance, except that uh, the head bishop, the Metropolitan of Kiev, sits on the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church, and that the Patriarch does certain things, the Patriarch of Moscow, such as confirms the election of the Metropolitan of Kiev, and then installs him as part of the enthronization ceremony. So there's been a sort of a back and forth in that relationship through the ups and downs and, and really the chaos of the Soviet period, World War II, the Cold War, all of this changed at the end of the Soviet period uh, when under Gorbachev, the uh, churches that had been illegal uh, were again legalized and returned to Ukraine. These are the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church and the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church. Uh, right after that, or essentially at the same time, the Moscow Patriarchate uh, elevated, changed the statutes of the church under Moscow, granting what it uh, defined as very broad autonomy without actually classifying or categorizing it as an autonomous church. And the reason that this is important is that to this day, Metropolitan Anufri, who was the primate of the Ukrainian church under Moscow, sits uh, has a permanent seat on the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. And really, since 2014 in particular, it has been difficult for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under Moscow, because uh, as we know, uh, Crimea became part of the Russian Federation through aggression, through mm -hmm. uh, military force. And you also have separatists uh, claiming or declaring independence in the Donbas region. Interestingly, at that time, the Ukrainian church under Moscow still had bishops sitting on its synod that were located in Crimea, in Luhansk, and in Donetsk, mm. in these separatist regions. But it was at that time that you kind of have uh, a number of messages happening simultaneously. So on the one hand, uh, the Ukrainian church under Moscow uh, was often uh, came under public criticism for refusing 
to uh, publicly support the Ukrainians in the war in Donbas. There was a rather controversial media moment in 2015 when then President Poroshenko asked all of the dignitaries and the members of parliament to stand for a moment of silence in honor of the Ukrainian soldiers who had fallen. And the three metropolitans of the church under Moscow refused to stand. Mm -hmm. So this was, you know, uh, a moment of media scandal, but it became a pretty consistent refrain for them that they are against all war and only want peace and are trying to hold together a really diverse group of people in one Ukrainian church. And what's interesting is that thread has kind of continued even today. Um, if you read the appeals that Metropolitan Anufri and the Holy Synod of the Church under Moscow have uh, made public, they continue to say that they're against the war, that the war is sin, that the war is evil. But what has changed is that now they are appealing directly to President Putin. And very clearly, there are many bishops in the church under Moscow who have publicly announced that they will not commemorate Patriarch Kirill mm. at the Divine Liturgy. So on the one hand, you know- uh, can, I, I, can I ask you about that actually? Yeah. So this is an interesting practice that you see a lot in Eastern churches of mentioning the name or announcing the name during the service, right? During the Sunday uh, celebration of the Eucharist. Uh, announcing the name of their sort of head bishop as a way of um, of what um, kind of uh, expressing unity under the bishop. So what's the what's the significance of omitting uh, a name in this context? Yeah, I think the significance is that it's a ritual expression of protest. Mm. It's a ritual mm. omission. Uh, and what was very interesting was that one of the first bishops to announce that they were going to stop uh, commemorating uh, Patriarch Kirill was Metropolitan of Logi of Sumi, which was considered to be a church that was quite friendly to the Russian Federation, to, you know, really against autocephaly, independence. And that was somewhat of a surprise and, and received a rather stern rebuke from the patriarchal office mm. of the Russian Orthodox Church itself fairly quickly. It, it caught their attention. So, you know, as long as Metropolitan Onufri continues to commemorate Patriarch Kirill at the liturgy, you know, the, the unity has not been broken. There's still Eucharistic unity, uh, even if there are, you know, uh, obvious problems and uh, fissures and separations. But this public announcement of an act of protest uh, is, is one way of expressing displeasure. And the other one was that there were whole eparchies that asked Metropolitan Onufri to convoke a Ukrainian council uh, uh, to either ask Patriarch Kirill and the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church for autocephaly, uh -huh. or to uh, declare it on their own. Mm. And in my estimation, given the events of the last four to five years, that's, that's an earthquake. Yeah. in the church, because uh, there has been all of this talk about how we don't need autocephaly because we're autonomous. The leaders of the church have repeatedly said under Moscow, we have everything we need to be a church. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. that's a much more uh, ominous sign of fracture within the Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, it may be that they have arrived at a point of, of no return, time will tell. Yeah, no, this is a really, uh, this is a really interesting development that's really just been even changing in, in these last few days as, as more, we see more and more bishops from the Ukrainian church under the Moscow Patriarchate make these kinds of ritual protests or write statements or, uh, uh, you know, publish things on their websites that rebuke President Putin and that, uh, as you said, in, in, in some cases, whether in a subtle ritual way or an explicit way, um, call out their own chief kind of bishop, which is the Moscow, the Patriarch of Moscow, uh, Kirill. Um, so there's an interesting dynamic here with Kirill as a person, uh, as as the Patriarch of, as the current Patriarch of Moscow. Um, the, the protest against him seems to express some dis dissatisfaction, not only with the fact that they are under Moscow, 
uh, as a church um, in Russia, and Russia is the aggressor in this war, but also something very particular with Patriarch Kirill himself. Um, could you speak a little bit about what how he has reacted to this war, considering that um, a, a large percentage of his flock is actually uh, in Ukraine? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, when when I started to think about our session this afternoon, I was looking back at some of the material that I had collected in 2014 when the entire situation blew up. And I want to, to turn to that very briefly because what we see, I think this will help to illustrate the reason for the protest, the reason that, that many Ukrainians were in the church under Moscow in a certain sense, feel that they're betrayed. Um, I'm going to just quote a very short excerpt from a series of texts, sermons, and um, addresses that Patriarch Kirill gave in 2014 on the 700th anniversary of uh, Saint Sergius of Radonezh, and it's about the uh, Holy Rus or the Russian world, if you will as a sort of a, a present multinational reality that is anchored in the three nations of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. And we need to keep in mind that, that all of this is happening in the context of the war, the presence of Russian soldiers first in Crimea mm -hmm. and then in Donbass. And I just wanted to very briefly refer to this because, um, in his address uh, and addressing Putin in particular, uh, Patriarch Kirill back then said that our people, our fatherland, uh, historical Russia, we must be unanimous to guard our unity, our spiritual unity and our other human unity, which is expressed by uh, many ways and means today. And he clarified what he meant by fatherland. He said, uh, when I say fatherland, I mean all of historical Rus, which would be the uh, historical ancestors of today's nations of Ukraine and Belarus in addition to Russia. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, I believe that by the grace of God, we will overcome all of the internecine feuds and discord in the lands of historical Rus. And he even said that uh, no one has any reason to fear military action on the part of Russia as a kind of a way to try to reassure that uh, the Moscow Patriarchate, the Russian Orthodox Church, could be a place where people would feel safe, a safe space. You know, all of this literature is pointing to the creation of a space that's inhabited by the, primarily by peoples of these countries. But if you follow the actual literature itself of all of the different people. So I think what, what has happened here is really to be honest, that this invasion caught uh, the pastors, the deans, the people, and the bishops of the Ukrainian church under Moscow by surprise. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, I don't think that any of them were evacuated from Ukraine. Uh -huh. you know, there was some time we didn't know where Metropolitan Anufri was, and it turned out that he was um, in his hometown, which is in Ukraine, uh, in uh, Chernivtsi. Mm -hmm. And I think that they were caught by surprise and that they feel betrayed and that this is the reason that, this, that they're protesting so vehemently. Um, Patriarch Kirill identified this Russian world as uh, a place where the values of Holy Rus would be preserved and defended uh, against their enemies. Mm. And you know, this then the you question is- This is back in 2014. Yeah. Yep, and, and it has an echo, right? Because mm. well then, who are the enemies? The same year, Metropolitan Hilarion Alfeyev speaking in Europe. Another Moscow Orthodox, patriarch. Another Moscow patriarch uh, uh, head bishop. The head, I believe, of the Department of External Relations. Right. Oxford educated, um, very widely published, well known figure, musician. Um, so uh, he explicitly identified the uh, Uniat Church and the Schismatics 
as uh, aggressive, as responsible for the mm-hmm. violence that had broken out in 2014. And he even said that he was using the forum of the Catholic Orthodox dialogue to try to ask the Catholics to calm down the quote, hotheads of the Greek Catholics from uh, deepening the polarization of peoples. And here's what I think is really important because this phrase appears in so many other places. He says that uh, uniatism is a Catholic project that is aimed at uh, Russia and orthodoxy and at weakening, threatening the Moscow Patriarchate in particular. Hmm. And so here you have this binary of West, East, values versus values. Um, where uh, people who want to adhere to orthodox values can feel safe and where their safety will be threatened and an assurance of protection from military aggression. So if you think about Uh almost 10 years now of this kind of language being circulated and repeated over and over again, I think that one can understand when uh, parishioners are having to evacuate, their homes are being destroyed. They might be without basic human needs. Uh, I don't know what the numbers are, but in the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which we haven't talked about that much yet, uh, I know at least three priests have been killed. Mm-hmm. Um, this is, uh, pastors just can't ignore that, you know, and there would be no reason for them to do so. So I think that they that this that they feel betrayed, but it also seems to illuminate the person of Patriarch Kirill. There's often been a question of does he really believe in this ideology that's being promulgated? You're from, talking about the ideology of the you're talking about the ideology of Russian world, the Ruski Mir, this kind of civilizational block of traditional values and stuff. Precisely. That's yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. And most recently, this last Sunday on Cheese Fair Sunday, which is the Sunday before Lent in the Orthodox tradition, it's also known as Forgiveness Sunday, which involves this rite of forgiveness. Um, we don't have Ash Wednesday for those of you who aren't familiar, but, but we have this uh, really beautiful rite where we ask one another uh, to forgive uh, one another of our sins. And we have a ritual where we bow down and exchange the kiss of peace. On this Sunday, uh, Patriarch Kirill justified the war in Donbass, saying that it was a, a, you know, really a spiritual war that was being played out uh, for righteousness, for mm-hmm. truth. And in his comments, he referred first to the crimes that the Ukrainians had allegedly committed in Donbass, and this is has a direct parallel to the accusation made by Putin and his regime that justifies the invasion of Ukraine, you know, the so-called denazification uh, to end the genocide that has been alleged in Donbass. And also he threw in their gay parades, you know, and this is an obvious reference to um, Ukraine's uh, kind of ongoing desire to be part of the European Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, this this gets us into a, a really interesting question about, um, since we're on the topic of this kind of notion of a, a Russian civilization that extends beyond the physical borders of Russia, this idea of Russian world. It's not just about uh, the acquisition of territory, although that's part of it, right? That's that's part of the invasion of, of, of Donbass and of Crimea, um, but it's also somehow about um, putting forth a, a specific vision of culture, a specific vision of the world in opposition to, let's say, the EU or the certain val- European Western values. So with, I, I was, I, I read that uh, that sermon by Patriarch Hidal, uh last Sunday and was really struck by this reference that he made to gay parades. So one of, uh, it was sort of ex- inexplicable to me when I read it because he said that, the you know, uh, somehow the the, inv- the 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 special military operations of Russia in the Donbas in Ukraine have a connection to to um, whether or not Ukraine is going to accept gay parades. So it's it's sort of a, it's a it's a I guess you could call it a dog whistle of some sort, but it's referencing a culture war kind of um, 
mentality. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what is the role of a, a sort of culture war in this war? Because it seems like the patriarch Kirill himself is also invoking this kind of culture war. Right, yes. I think this is where you have a fusion of the political and the religious spheres that um, really needs to be examined uh, with some precision. Um, uh, the whole idea of preserving cultural values of conservatism, uh, and, and we both know that this, that this doesn't happen very often in the Orthodox tradition, uh, we have it documented both in the Russian Orthodox tradition and also more recently in the ecumenical patriarchate. And this is the publication of official uh, social concept or social ethos documents. Right. So uh, the Russian Orthodox Church published theirs in 2000, and there is extensive discussion about the church's position on values like this, uh, ranging from the, the role of women in society to the church's stance on uh, the LGBTQ community and um, how that fits in with orthodoxy and in the church. So for example, that document makes it very clear that the Orthodox church does not believe, the Russian Orthodox church, that uh, a homosexual person uh, could be a teacher in a school. Hmm. Um, and there is al there's also some controversy surrounding the whole question of uh, baptism of what happens, for example, if you have transgender parents uh, or different methods of conception being used. Mm -hmm. um, so supposedly the Russian Orthodox Church is, is going to be uh, anchored in this social concept document, the defender of traditional values. And in the public arena, they have not shied away from this. We mentioned uh, Metropolitan Hilarion Alfeyev before. Mm -hmm. He has been the one uh, who in Europe has uh, really challenged the uh, European Union and uh, focused upon this kind of clash of values and uh, where the church stands on values. And, and the reason that this is important for this conversation is the insinuation of uh, Ukraine creating an alliance with the European Union and possibly um, you know, seeking to become a, a member of NATO. Mm -hmm. This uh, whole idea, uh, at least in the public discourse, if we're looking at this from a discursive point of view, suggests that Ukraine is accepting of these values. Mm. And if you look more closely, when these questions have come up in the public sphere in Ukraine, the religious leaders have consistently been fairly conservative. Yeah. in their approaches to taking these issues on. So, for example, when the new Orthodox Church of Ukraine was created, mm -hmm. um, Metropolitan Epiphany uh, publicly stated that he would be open to having a conversation of changing the church calendar from old to new uh -huh. and celebrating Christmas on December 25th. Because currently it's celebrated on, on January 7th, according to the older calculation. That's right. And um, the reason I, the only reason I mention that is because that was considered to be really progressive uh -huh. to in, in Ukraine, in Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. And Ukraine is not quite as conservative as Russia on um, on uh, same sex marriage and, and issues like that. But in general, the churches have been pretty conservative, yeah. you know, but there's this in the public discourse. There's this notion that if Ukraine is kind of a border um, between uh, East and West, which, you know, is really murky territory, um, probably be more accurate to, to speak of uh, Eastern and Central Europe than necessarily West, but uh, we go with what we have. Sure. Um, it, it, it just fits very neatly in the discourse to, to include Ukraine in the Russian world, in the Moscow Patriarchate would be to expand that border. Um, whereas Ukraine itself in the church um, really has the capacity to be able to address these issues on its own. And it has, at least in recent history, when these issues have uh, risen to the fore, 
um, proven to be fairly conservative. And I say this simply as a matter of fact, because it doesn't fit the uh, information that's circulating about what it means to be um, allied with Europe. Mm. Um, and I might, I hope you don't mind, I want to also mention sure. that uh, Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople became somewhat of a lightning rod figure when he decided to intervene in Ukraine in 2018 to 19. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is that one of the grievances that has been publicly declared against Patriarch Bartholomew is that his office, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, is uh, unionist by nature because of the Council of Florence. Union, so, in other words, they want they want to reunite with Rome, right? Which is going to then, uh, you know, expose in this public discourse the entire Orthodox world to European values, to Catholic right. proselytism, and we're not even talking about the, the Roman Catholic debates on these issues. So, <laughs> right. Um, well, actually, let's maybe let's talk a, a little bit about the ecumenical patriarch and in particular the, the granting of autocephaly to the Orthodox Church in Ukraine in 2019. I mean, there is an interesting kind of history there, right? There is a there is a it's not just a religious history. It's also a kind of a political history. Um, and to the extent that uh, the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople is seen by some of these other forces as being somehow allied with the West, it, 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 it adds a kind of further political dimension to their granting of autocephaly to the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. So could you give us a little bit of background for that and maybe how that might tie into this question of, of invasion and war in the context of these kind of debate about values, East and West? Yeah. Um, so let me, let's start with, with uh, recent activity in the ecumenical patriarchate. Um, we know, for example, uh, if we're just pulling out of our hat uh, fairly well-known public events, we know about the uh, exchange of the kiss of peace between Pope Paul VI and Patriarch Athenagoras in 1964 in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. which uh, at least seemed to symbolize uh, a new era of rapprochement between the Catholic and the Orthodox churches. And we also know that it has now become traditional on the feasts of uh, Saints Peter and Paul, and also on St. Andrew for the heads, for the, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, and uh, Patriarch Bartholomew to come together as a public gesture to show that they continue to engage in dialogue. Right. Um, and the Patriarch of Constantinople, this one in particular, has been very committed to carrying out ecumenical dialogue. Um, and, you know, kind of hanging in the balance is this legacy. I mentioned the Council of Florence of 1448 or 1438 to 39. And we know that there was a political undercurrent, uh, the Ottoman threat the need for Western military aid, uh, and a brief period where some of the Orthodox Church had restored union with uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we didn't talk so much about the Union of Brest in 1596, where the, uh, when the, the bishops of the Kievan Metropolia uh, entered into Eucharistic union with Rome, and he essentially created a Greek Catholic community where the ritual remains entirely Orthodox. Theology, canon law is still Eastern, notwithstanding some Latinizations that occurred uh, throughout history. Um, but the, there's a recognition of the Bishop of Rome as the first Bishop uh, of the Christian world. What's important I think about uh, that event and the continued existence of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church mm -hmm. is that um, they referred to the Council of Florence as the basis for their union, and they continue to do so to this day. Mm. And in Ukraine, uh, among uh, representatives of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine and the Ukrainian Catholic Church, there is continued dialogue to try to find common ground. 
um, this dialogue uh, really kind of reburst onto the scene during the course of uh, the environment of World War II when mm -hmm. Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church wrote several letters to Orthodox leaders trying to uh, find uh, common ground and to create one church in Ukraine that would be Kievan. It would be uh, presumably in communion with Rome, Constantinople, Kiev, and Moscow. Mm. That was the goal, you know, that, that the Ukrainian church would kind of become the adhesive that would bring these uh, separated Christian churches back together. Mm. Now, the Orthodox have been uh, lukewarm at best in responding to these overtures. Uh, but what's important here is that the Patriarch of Constantinople is committed to ecumenical dialogue. Right. When he was the one who finally intervened after uh, decades, really a century, mm -hmm. of one appeal after another coming from uh, a vocal uh, cohort of Ukrainians that wanted an autocephalous church and said, I am going to give you autocephaly. Um, that created, uh, I think what it did was it inspired fear on the part of those who are simply don't want to have any dialogue with the West at all, mm. that if Orthodox Ukrainians then become part of this dialogue and are participating in it, that that's going to make everyone become uniot. Now, I don't think that's what the Patriarch of Constantinople is trying to do, um, but it has gotten caught up in the informational warfare. I see. And it's an important point in terms of, uh, you know, those who, who look to him as a hero in Ukraine. And it's just fascinating to me that when we look at the literature, both the literature that uh, the Russian church itself used to celebrate the 500 year of their autocephaly, and in more recent literature that sort of implicated the patriarch of Constantinople, really, um, you know, calling him a schismatic, for creating the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, um, all of it points to them as being unionist, that this is all part of this ploy to reunite the entire Orthodox Church with Rome. And I think that, you know, I, I don't know if I've seen it stated, but I think that a part of it is that then Orthodoxy will be subordinate right. to Rome in this paradigm. So, so, it, so it's on the one hand, there's a fear of ecumenism because of the threat of possible subordination to Rome and to the papacy, given, given all that history, but also contact with Rome, ecumenical kind of dialogue also opens them up to the danger of the West and sort of Western values um, in, in this kind of conception. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, and historical memory, I think, plays a very important role here. Yeah. We have to keep in mind that um, the Great Patriotic War is a really significant event in, in the Russian mindset. And this is, what, the, this is how World War II is, is commonly referred to. Yes, exactly. Um, Victory Day is kind of like a big feast day on May 9th yeah. among Russians, many Ukrainians and Belarusians as well, but Russians in particular. And um, in the Cold War period, some of the letters that were written um, to former Ukrainian Catholics who were forced into the Moscow Patriarchate uh, essentially said that it is a good thing that you have been liberated from the threat of the West, from Catholic mm -hmm. proselytism, from fascism, from the uh, threat that the Nazi Germany posed to the entire world. All of these entities are lumped together right. as a threat. And I don't think that, you know, I think that it, it continues to linger. The West, the West is dangerous. Right. And, and that, that association with fascism and Nazism is so important here in the context of this war, because ostensibly that was Putin's um, reasoning for, for, for this special military operation was to denazify uh, Ukraine. And, you know, <laughs> many people have pointed out that the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky himself is Jewish. Uh, and so there's a, there's a, there's a disconnect here with the language of denazification and the sort of reality of Ukrainian politics. But it seems like it's, it's not so much a reference to a current political reality as, as much as it is about um, this aspect of historical memory of associating um, 
the West with fascism and with Nazism um, in, in World War II. That's right. Um, in fact, when Stalin revived the Orthodox Church in 1943, immediately the three bishops in the three main cities, Stalingrad, Moscow, um, Leningrad, began to, to, to uh, publicly proclaim epistles and sermons calling upon the people, the Orthodox people who were in Nazi occupied Germany to forsake their occupiers and to return to their to their homeland. And there were threats made in those epistles, you know, very strong language was used. Um, and, you know, a part of this comes from uh, where does nationalism go? You know, what kind of uh, ideologies uh, kind of attach themselves to nationalism? During World War II, especially early in the period of the German occupation in Ukraine itself, there was a sense that Ukraine uh, would become an independent sovereign republic. Mm -hmm. And it, were that to happen, it would have been, um, you know, the, there were some fighters who were trying to make that happen. Um, and one of the organizations was the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, and they had some fairly radical and dangerous uh, thinkers and leaders in that organization. One of them was Stepan Bandera. Uh -huh. So now any time that someone uh, in contemporary Ukraine uh, calls for a fight for democracy. Uh, so for example, Petro Poroshenko, mm -hmm. former president of Ukraine, his election refrain was army, language, faith. Mm -hmm. Army, language, faith. You know, bellicose language and kind of a lumping of the three together. Mm -hmm. um, immediately, Bandera's spirit rises mm -hmm. and uh, whoever that leader is becomes like Bandera um, without any critical parsing out of who these people are and what the battle is for today. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's in a very important part of the issue. It's a very creative historic manipulation of history, of recent mm -hmm. history. Wow, thank you for thank you for that. I I want to turn now in our last uh, ten or twelve minutes here for, to some to some questions from our listening audience. Um, maybe a couple, um, a couple of quick ones you can answer. Um, has the the key of caves lava, the key of Pichirskaya lava, uh, been shelled? Uh, do we know this? This is one of the main spiritual centers of um, Ukrainian and Russian, frankly, Orthodox Christianity. To my knowledge, it has not, unless something has happened in the last few minutes. Okay. Um, I do know that an alert went out last week uh, of a threat to shell St. Sophia Cathedral. Oh. But to my knowledge, the Key of Caves Lavra has not been shelled. Um, I do know that some churches have been shelled, but, but no, at least to my knowledge, yet national monuments. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, another, another quick one. Is it true that Ukraine provides most of the priests for Russia, for the Russian Orthodox Church? Well, that was the common refrain, uh, I, you know, for, for many decades up until this point. Uh, I actually don't know if that's the case now. I think some of what we've heard in the media, uh, what do we mean when we say that? Do we mean that, that there's a real importation of clergy who are trained in Ukraine to then serve in parishes in Russia, kind of like a, a cross migration happening. Um, that certainly was the case early in, in Russian imperial history and the modernization of Russia was a, a, a big deal. And a lot of that was happening um, in the immediate post-Soviet period. To my knowledge now, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I don't think it, uh, I, would, I wouldn't affirm that as, as a given fact. I think there's a desire on the part of, of Ukrainians to kind of stay in their homeland and, and serve the parishes there. Yeah. Uh, here's another question. You know, we're talking about how we have these historical divisions between the Moscow Patriarch Ukrainian Church and the Autocephalous Ukrainian Church. But, but now that there's a sort of, um, there's a sense of unity, at least a unity against the oppressor. So one, one, um, one of our audience members asks, the initial flood of transitions from Moscow Patriot, Patriarchate to the Ukrainian church, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine, um, between December 2018 and March 2019, slowed to a trickle in 2020, 2021. 
Do you see any indications that the invasion will catalyze another wave of priests or parishes switching from Moscow Patriarchate to the OCU? I wrote a piece yesterday that I hope will be published soon that uh, kind of comments on what the kind of future might look like for the Ukrainian churches. I, I think that that's likely at this point. But if you don't mind, I want to just briefly comment on that. That is one of the most difficult issues to uh, to really uh, get to the facts. Mm. Ukrainian law is complicated. And the Ukrainians changed their laws in 2018 and 2019 to try to make it easier for parishes to take control of the situation. But there's a huge difference between what happens at the level of the national parliament and what happens at the local level. Right. And so, for example, I had a conversation the last time I was able to visit Ukraine with one of the bishops asking, why has this slowed to trickle? Well, really it's part, the main reason was because of the bureaucracy and then COVID stopped everything. Right. You know, but but the, one of the big issues was that some bureaucrat had a number of petitions that was sitting on their desk and they were either slowed by lawsuits or they simply at the local level um, had bureaucratic obstacles where they weren't dealing with these petitions. Whether or not that would have been like a mass uh, migration from the Moscow Patriarchate to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine is, is still somewhat in doubt. Yeah, um, but I do think I certainly think that the war is going to catalyze a uh, much more rapid transition on that front. I do. Mm -hmm. um, another interesting question here in the chat. Um, so we talked about how Patriarch Kirill has made um, some statements that that the the support uh, Putin's war in Ukraine. Does Putin have the backing of the Russian Orthodox Church for this war? Kirill aside, um, obviously he's the main spokesperson for that church, but the broader church in Russia, do you have a sense that he has their support? Um, in Russia? Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, that there is literature that uh, definitely demonstrates and asserts uh, quite persuasively that the informational campaign has been quite successful in Russia. There was a sense uh, among Russians that the Ukrainians, when they uh, carried out the Euromaidan Revolution of Dignity, keeping in mind that that was not, uh, you know, representative of all of Ukraine, mm -hmm. you know, um, that was a, a, a localized, powerful event, uh, a very idealistic one. And I think that in a certain sense, we're seeing certain parts of that dream being revived. Um, in the Ukrainian response to the Russian invasion today. The important point is that um, in Russia, many viewed this Maidan revolution of dignity as a betrayal. Okay. You know, they thought we truly are. One of the refrains is that, that Putin uh, made infamous in the speech that he gave last year is that Ukrainians and Russians are one people. Hmm. And many, many Russians believe that they are one people. And when the Ukrainians carried out the Maidan, uh, and essentially basically said, we are going to be the creators and the writers of our own history. Some Russians saw this as a betrayal, which led, uh, I think it crossed the line from what uh, Cyril Hovrun very ably calls political religion, mm -hmm. uh, where there's a desire to uh, act out in violence and aggression uh, to eliminate the enemy, to see them as uh, satanic and servants of the devil. Another scholar who is, whose uh, work on this topic is really eye-opening is Mikhail Suslov, who teaches in Finland. He has traced the role of social media in um, influencing Russian Orthodox thought, both among clergy and laity. Yeah. That being said, we are seeing voices of protest against the war and of real shock uh, coming from Russian communities outside of Russia today. So I think that um, on the one hand, inside of Russia, yes, I think that there is some support for this war. And if there's opposition, there, there, it's probably being muted by fear of reprisal yeah. in Western Europe and North America and other places we're seeing uh, more of a shock and a response, uh, really disappointment in Patriarch Kirill's justification of the war. Yeah. Yeah, I want to mention too, I, I came across a petition that was signed by, I think, four or 500 clergy of the Russian Orthodox Church that was sent, I think, to Patriarch Kirill asking him to 
condemn this war. Um, I mean, that's four or 500 priests out of thousands, uh, thousands and thousands. So, um, but again, you know, whether this is indication of broad support for the war or indication of fear of speaking out, there's a lot of ways to interpret that. But from, from my understanding, you're right. There's a, there's a information war going on here in Russia and Putin is winning that. Um, maybe one or two more questions here from the chat. Um, you mentioned, uh, Nick, a national council of religions in Ukraine. Can you elaborate on the relations between the Orthodox and Greek Catholic hierarchs with Jewish and Muslim communities in Ukraine? Yes, um, the uh, All Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations provides a forum for these diverse religious groups to kind of uh, find common ground. And I think that in a certain sense, some people might view it as a pro forma place. But it, it is significant in my estimation that even, uh, even before the, the uh, invasion began, that the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate uh, uh, has consistently had a representative who has participated in, affirmed, and signed the declarations of shock and of uh, disappointment and really of implication of Putin so there is, they've been able to find common ground mm -hmm. um, in terms of the relations among them, at least at this level, I think it's one of the mechanisms in Ukrainian society that, that works pretty well. Um, and and it, it, I think it's important for us to know that the Ukrainian Jewish community has been quite vocal in uh, answering these questions about are there neo-Nazis in the Ukrainian mm -hmm. government, are Jews threatened by Ukraine, uh, pointing to the return of thousands of Jews to Ukraine in the post-Soviet period, particularly in the last many years, and finding Ukraine to be a hospitable place, not to mention following the annexation of Crimea, uh, Islamic Crimean Tatars moving to Ukraine and finding uh, the freedom to be able to practice their faith and, and to live in Ukrainian society. I'm not trying to idealize it, every place has its problems, but this is a mechanism that works where people with differences are able to find common ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot more questions in the chat and I'm really sorry to everyone if, if we weren't able to answer your question, there's so many good ones. Um, I would encourage you uh, to follow up with uh, with me. Um, you can find me on the VLISM website and I'll be happy to direct your uh, question to Professor Denisenko. Uh, but so I, uh, being mindful of the time, I want to just close down our conversation uh, and thanks you, thank you once again, uh, Professor Denisenko uh, for just you know giving us some insight into this really complicated and um, really troubling and sad reality. Uh, of of the war in Ukraine and the role of religion. So um, yeah, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to be with you today. And I I, I guess that I would just ask that uh, we would, could all join in prayer um, and in solidarity with those who are suffering the most. The need for humanitarian aid is 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 dire in Ukraine. That's the one refrain I hear the loudest uh, mm -hmm. is need for assistance. So. Thank you for the time. It's my pleasure to, to be with you today. Thanks. And um, everyone, this, this conversation will be record, is, has been recorded and uh, will be posted shortly. So check back on the Yale Institute of Sacred Music website for more information about that or find us on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. Um, thanks for everyone for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again at uh, one of our events. So everyone take care. <laughs>